Tout d'abord, merci d'être venu rencontrer Rachel, qui nous fait le plaisir de, de passer à Paris pour, pour nous parler des lance-flammes. Et j'aurais voulu savoir, en fait, comment l'idée de ce livre, euh, tu étais venue, Rachel, comment tu as eu l'idée d'imbriquer, de, 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 en fait, toutes ces histoires et ces thèmes The book does seem to enfold different worlds. One of the great challenges of it was to find a connection among the worlds. But um, as a reader of novels, um, I'm not so interested when the worlds come together completely like this, and then you have a kind of grand, elegant conspiracy. I don't think that for me, uh, the experience of life works in that manner. But with my own conception of history, I was interested in certain things that took place in the 1970s, in particular what happened in the art world in New York City. And as I began to think about that time, I have some relationship to it personally. It's something that I know about. It would not require research. As I looked into it, I started to think more deeply uh, about that historical moment on a grander scale. In the United States, it is the end of the industrial era. And this uh, was reflected in the materials and lifestyle of artists at that time. And so these things were on my mind. Um, that's how the novel began, was as a novel looking into the atmosphere of the 70s in New York City in the art world. As I was writing this New York part, I began to encounter, just in my own intellectual life, uh, a lot of information about the uh, 1970s on the left in Italy. Um, there was a movement there called Autonomia. Some of you may be familiar with it, sort of like Italy's version of May 68 happened later. Uh, and it happened, they called it the creeping May. It happened slowly through the course of the 70s and then very notoriously ended when the former prime minister Aldo Moro was assassinated. And just in my own private life, I happened to encounter um, a lot of people Uh, who had been involved in that movement or were of a younger generation who became interested in that movement because it's very repressed in Italy. It's not uh, a kind of polite bourgeois subject. People do not want to talk about what happened in the 70s. And I realized that many key events from that time in Italy um, sort of were taking place at identical times to key events in the United States, in New York City, in the 70s. Like there was a huge demonstration in Rome in March of 1977, where 100,000 people poured into the streets. And just three months later, in the United States, there was a blackout, very famously, in July of 1977. And I decided that in some way these things are connected, but not over-connected. And the project of the book was really to write about both. And in order to do so, I had to even pan further back and look at industrial history and these Italian families. And I'm interested in futurism and speed. And I think that all of these things uh, come to bear on the moment, when the moment is such a historically critical one, which is the end of industrial culture. Reno, qui est la narratrice, c'est un peu une page blanche. On sait très peu de choses d'elle, sinon qu'elle vient de cette ville du Nevada, que c'est une fille à moto, euh, qu'elle aime la photo, la vitesse, et, euh, mais rien d'autre. Et en fait, quand on, quand, on, quand on arrive à New York avec elle, un peu, elle devient un peu notre caméra et euh, c'est un peu cette page blanche qu'elle va, qu va remplir des autres, en fait, des expériences des autres. Euh, c'est assez inhabituel dans, dans un roman que la narratrice soit si mystérieuse. Et j'aurais bien aimé que tu nous en parles un petit peu plus. Oui, pour moi, l'expérience de écrire le livre, 
the voice of the narrator was critical. Because she's first person, this will help me to answer. Uh, I wanted her to speak in a way that seemed like, like thought. Sometimes a first person traditionally, historically, is a more confessional voice or a voice of testimony, at least that would be its you know, uh, historic roots. Or it's a very voicey voice where someone is speaking and they're using the way that they speak to tell you about themselves in a performative manner. And uh, she is not a performative narrator. I suppose I was thinking um, about what it's like to be very young uh, and not quite naive, but not culturally sophisticated yet. Most people are, have some moment in their life before they pass through into sophistication, but they aren't, you know, uh, they aren't unsophisticated before that. They can see and read people uh, maybe a little more clearly before they have to kind of pretend like they n understand perfectly what's going on around them. I enjoy writing from the perspective of someone who has a sardonic sensibility, but isn't afraid not to know things. I, I think unknowing is a, there's something honest and more realistic to me than a narrator who pretends to have uh, an analysis of every other person in the room. There's something false about it. And finally, um, she reports mostly as something like a camera on what other people say because she's young and she is sort of drowned out by the other characters. So they speak a lot more than she does. And I think that life is sometimes like that the hungriest speak, and others pull back. And when you want to learn, when you're young in a situation that is a conversation that's taking place a bit above your head, you don't learn really by speaking. That's my experience. You learn uh, by listening, and she is a listener. The parts of the book that are told, most of it is told in her voice, uh, it's really about her enchantment with a world. And it's a world that I felt enchanted by too as I was writing it. Um, of course, it includes some aspects that are more negative and cruel, but I wanted the reader to be immersed in her experience so that hopefully they too could see what she's enchanted by. Probably they can see things that she can't, but I wanted them to be very close to and bound to her perspective, which is why we don't know a lot about her past. Uh, people don't generally psychologize themselves to the degree that they do in books so that you can get a tidy back story. La question justement de l'identité, c'est un des grands thèmes du livre. Et euh, Reno, c'est un personnage en construction justement. Par contre, tous les autres personnages du livre, presque tous, se réinventent sans cesse. Euh, Valera, quand il rencontre cette bande de motards avant-gardistes, dit lui-même euh, « Valera est mort, euh, si j'ai quelqu'un d'autre euh, ». Son fils se présente comme un artiste new-yorkais avec un accent italien. Euh, Ronnie euh, lui change d'histoire selon ses humeurs. Euh, c'est à la fois une grande liberté pour un auteur que d'avoir des personnages qui se réinventent comme ça, mais c'est en même temps une gageur de, de les faire exister euh, vraiment dans l'émotion et de les faire exister aussi euh, aux autres personnages. Si je comprends la question, je pense que peut-être une des idées que j'ai circulé autour quand je suis écrivant le livre, um, especially when I was writing the dialogue, and I love to write dialogue, something happens, I don't know, but uh, um, I think I began to suspect that for some people, um, the lies that they tell, the stories that they invent, the impressions that they try to create uh, in their performance of self, um, tells you as much about that person as this moment where they try to be perfectly candid 
and truthful and say something uh, that relates to what they consider to be their own es essence or essential truth. Um, I'm, I'm not quite a cynic, but I'm not sure if I believe in essential character truths that can be possessed by that character. And because I was writing about artists, and I have known many artists, I have found that their performance uh, in social situations can be as inspired um, as the work that they do. In the art, the social component of the art world is enormous. It's a huge part of what artists are. And I have known so many who are, they can never stop kidding. Um, and inventing, and the idea of a need for a straight set of facts. You know, I immigrated to the United States this year. I am from this kind of family. Um, the, like basic psychology, a lot of people want to play with that. And I think that in their play, they are telling you something, even if they're not telling you a straight narrative that you can use to analyze them. And many of the people in the book seemed to keep presenting themselves this way to the narrator and I guess it's perhaps I have encountered people like that and I have found them um, interesting. Le rapport que Rayora a la moto, comment avez-vous fait pour si bien décrire ça Et même moi qui ai jamais fait de moto, j'avais l'impression que j'étais effectivement en volant de cette moto. Si vous pouvez développer un peu sur Est-ce que vous avez fait des recherches Est-ce que vous expérimentez Qu'est-ce que ça représente pour vous cette histoire de moto Par rapport aussi au fait qu'elle est une fille, qu'est-ce qu'on fille Oh, thank you. That's a great question. Um, yeah, I... Uh, gosh, many things I could say. Um, I often choose to write about topics that are familiar to me. Um, you know, the narrator, of course, is not me. It's not about my life. But when I was developing her, um, I came across uh, some images by an artist named Michael Heiser, an earth artist from the 70s, where he had taken a motorcycle and made these huge tracks in the desert. And I thought, oh, my character could do something like that. And then she would be a motorcycle rider, and it was pretty easy for me to describe her relationship to the bike because I spent many years riding and working on them and racing them myself uh, in my 20s. Um, I don't ride anymore, but I did for a long time, and I grew up around motorcycles. Um, my father had British motorcycles and he was always working on them in the garage and we lived near a racetrack and uh, I have an older brother he has no interest um, in motorcycles whatsoever like he cannot drive a standard shift car <laughs> um, but I was always interested and not just in speed and motorcycles but really the entire culture um, and even as a little girl, I had so much respect for people who could work on them. Um, and it, when I, after high school, I got a, I started buying, I saved up and bought an Italian motorcycle, a Moto Guzzi, it was my first bike. And I just really immersed myself in the world of um, people who rode and worked on and raced these sort of temperamental Italian motorcycles. So it was nice to be able to use some of that knowledge uh, in the book, although I hadn't planned to put it in, it just seemed to kind of fit. Um, and it fit also when I, I wanted to write about um, some critical historical moments in the 20th century. And I thought the motorcycle would be an interesting way to do that. And when I started thinking about, like, for instance, the role of motorcycles in war, that seemed incredible to me suddenly. Uh, so I guess that's, yeah, how it came about. Oh, I could just add, like the narrator, I also crashed going uh, oh. <laughs> like 200 kilometers an hour or something. And I don't think I would have written that if I hadn't have experienced it because it would feel like guesswork. How can you know 
what that's like. It would be fake, maybe. But um, since I had had that experience, I wanted to try to describe it for someone else because hopefully most of you have not done that. So. Par la même, la, la moto est aussi un lien dans cette notion de la ligne. C'est quelque chose d'essentiel dans votre regard sur l'art et sur l'art notamment qu'il soit du côté de l'ancien monde comme le nouveau monde, que ce soit dans les années 70 ou dans les années précédentes, notamment en faisant allusion au futurisme. Et il y a cette moto, il y a cette vitesse, mais il y a aussi cette notion de la ligne. Est-ce que vous nous, pouvez nous en parler un petit peu Yes, I think that's absolutely true. Um, well, the, the narrator wants to be an artist, and she talks about uh, drawing with her body on skis when she's young, which it's actually an idea that I took from Jean-Paul Sartre. He writes very beautifully uh, about, he decides that skiing um, is maybe the new perfect sport except that water skiing is, he thinks, a better sport because it doesn't create a wake, uh, whereas skiing in snow, as he says, leaves this messy, dirty wake behind. And it's very much these thoughts on the line and speed, and I think it's, in a way, a kind of metaphor for how we move through time. So yeah, the line was interesting to me. And of course, in the art world, uh, the 1970s is the moment at which the art object is becomes dematerialized. People uh, try to sort of transcend the dis making of discrete objects and do performances, you know, where you could just pass through a room and then that's your artwork. And there was quite a lot of this going on. And so I wanted to talk about this other line, which is, the dissolving line between people's lives and the artwork that they make and knowing one from the other. But yes, on the motorcycle, she's trying to create a sort of track. And that was just me uh, ruminating on Sartre's text about the line and doing something with it. I guess, you know, sometimes that's how writing works. I will read something from philosophy that I think inheres in real life and try to give it, you know, some sort of um, embodiment through characters. So the photo uh, is from an underground magazine in Rome from the late 1970s. And um, I found it online. My husband and I both found it online together. Uh, and we got a copy of that magazine. It's E. Volsci is what it's called. And there was this group. Uh, they were based on Via de Volsci in the San Lorenzo neighborhood in Rome. And the picture on the cover is a woman. I think she's a German woman. Um, and they put tape over the photo. And it was a kind of image in protest of the police having closed down the women's radio station. It was a free radio. It was a feminist station run by women, and it was shut down by the police, and there had been also a raid of it by fascists. So this is kind of in protest of censorship. Uh, and um, my husband thought it would make a good cover for the book, and I agreed with him. So we asked the publisher if they could put it on the cover, and there was a lot of, no, 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 you can't have this photo on the cover. Uh, they didn't really give us a good reason, and then eventually they agreed. Um, but then I got a phone call right before the book was supposed to go to press, very, very late from the lawyer for the big company that is the American publisher. And she said, she was kind of like a <clears throat> very businessy woman, and she said, well, there's a big problem with this book cover. We're not going to be able to run it. And I said, why? And she said, well, we can't guarantee that the person in the photo won't sue us because nobody is able to track down uh, who this woman is. And I've asked, I know people who were involved in this magazine, and I had friends in Italy, you know, going around to people who don't even have phones, kind of old autonomous, do you know who this woman is, who took this picture? And everybody said it was a German photographer and a German woman, and that the photographer uh, had died in the 1980s. Uh, a lot of these people have died. Um, but because they didn't know who the woman was, they said that I was at risk of a lawsuit. 
And I said, well, why would she sue me? Uh, she looks great, you know. And the lawyer said, well, let's say she married a, a big, important banker, and he doesn't know about her <laughs> radical past. And I thought, well, this is so unlikely. I mean, let's just see if that happens. <laughs> So they went ahead and took the risk and published it, and no one has come forward to say uh, that it was that it was her. So hopefully, I don't know. It's uh, it's coming out in Germany in the spring. Okay, it's and going they, to be very interesting. So uh, yes, I'll let you know. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Merci à tous. Merci.